The NTSB preliminary report on the MiG-23 ejection at the Willow Run Thunder Over Michigan Air Show back on August 13th is out, and it's left a lot of people confused as to what exactly happened there, and has got some people in the court of public opinion going down the wrong path. But again, this is only a very preliminary report with just some very basic information. Let's fill you in on some more detail as to what happened. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. Before I got on with the airlines, I was a U.S. Air Force pilot, a T-37 instructor pilot, an ejection seat aircraft, and I also flew T-38s in pilot training. Um, and ironically, I was here at uh, Mather Air Force Base as the T-37 instructor pilot, training WIZOs, weapon system operators, kids that were going into the back seat of fighter aircraft, and a lot of that training involved ejection seat training from two-seat fighter aircraft. Let's check it out. On August 13th, about 15.15 Eastern Daylight Time, the MiG-23 November 23 Uniform Bravo was destroyed when it was involved in the accident near Belleville, Michigan. The pilot and pilot-rated observer received minor injuries. Both of these gentlemen in, on board the aircraft were rated pilots. Both of them ha are military trained pilots with ejection seat training in their prior lives before getting on with the airlines. Both of them are active duty airline pilots or active airline pilots. And the pilot in the back seat was working on getting his MiG-23 type rating. And both of these pilots had flown this MiG-23 together as a crew for several times before this accident. The airplane was operated under FAR Part 91 Air Show Exhibition Flight. Remember, this aircraft is licensed under Experimental Exhibition. The flight was performed at the Thunder Over Michigan Air Show at Willow Run Airport. The accident flight was scheduled to be the second to last act. The accident airplane was a privately owned Russian designed military fighter airplane that employed variable geometry wings that allowed the wing sweep angle to be changed in flight. The airplane was powered by a single turbojet engine with afterburner capability. The pilot reported that the flight departed from runway 23 at Willow Run, followed by a right turn to a banana pass, a low level knife edge pass. A banana pass isn't exactly knife edge. It looks like knife edge to the photographers, but it's a bank angle coming past the cameras that give you a great camera view of the aircraft, but it's not quite 90 degrees. Along runway 23, following the pass, he, st he started banking the airplane and noticed the engine afterburner did not ignite. The second pass was supposed to be an afterburner pass. And the airspeed began to decrease. He brought the swing wings into the fully forward position at 16 degrees of sweep to increase lift and began troubleshooting the problem. He was actively troubleshooting when the rear seat observer Remember, he's not an observer, he's a rated pilot. They're working together as a crew. Stated that they needed to eject because he's watching the altitude and the airspeed and he knows the minimum ejection envelope of this aircraft, which we'll talk about more in a, in a minute. The pilot reported he was not ready to eject and was still troubleshooting the problem and maneuvered the airplane toward runway 27 at Willow Run when his ejection seat fired and he was out of the airplane. He stated that if either occupant pulls the ejection handle, both seats will eject. Quick review on the MiG-23 ejection seat system. When you pull the, when whichever, whomever pulls the ejection handle on the MiG-23, a lot of little miracles have to happen simultaneously in, for, in order to have a successful ejection. The primary ejection sequence of the equipment is, and you can see this in the pictures, first the canopy, the front canopy blows, followed by the rear seat canopy blowing, then the rear ejection seat ejects, and then the front ejection seat ejects. That's the sequence of events, and you can see that in the photographs. That's how the system works. By the way, this is a rocket-powered ejection seat. It is not a, a blast or charge-style ejection seat, but it is still a very violent ejection. 
The rear seat observer stated that the airplane made a pass along the runway. Okay, so this is the 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 pilot in the second seat's um, part of the report. The rear seat observer stated the airplane made a pass along the runway and the plan was to go to the left for another pass followed by a landing. That would have been the afterburner pass. He stated the engine was not accelerating. He and the pilot had a brief discussion and began to climb up to gain altitude. They determined that they had some type of engine problem, more on that in a minute, and needed to get back on the ground. He stated that they determined they did not have sufficient altitude to make it to a runway at the airport. He said they were compressed for time and needed to get out. When asked if he had pulled the ejection seat handles, he stated he could not specifically remember, but thinks that he would have pulled them. Video evidence indicates that the airplane was in a left-hand bank when the ejection seats fired. The airplane continued in a left bank and descended into the ground about one mile south of the approach end of runway 27 at Willow Run. The wreckage path was about 600 feet long on a heading of about 035 degrees. There was a post-impact explosion and fire. The fuselage, the fuselage section that contained the tail surfaces and engine came to a rest adjacent to an apartment building. The remainder of the airplane was fragmented and distributed along the wreckage path. There were no reported injuries on the ground. Very, very lucky. The KM-1 ejection seat in the MiG-23 is just a straight rocket propelled ejection seat. It has no gyroscopic gimbling capability of riding itself once it leaves the aircraft like modern Martin Baker seats. Whatever bank angle you're at when you eject, that's the angle you're coming out of the aircraft, further limiting your ejection envelope. Now let's go over this ejection sequence in at one quarter speed slow motion to observe that sequence. Before we, get, before we get into the sequence here, this crew had about 90 seconds from the time that they found that that engine was not responding. The engine had gone to idle RPM and was stuck in idle RPM, and that happened when they wanted to move the uh, engine up to full afterburner for the afterburner pass. So they go for afterburner, the engine drops off to idle and stays there. They had about 90 seconds to troubleshoot this problem. They're up on the left downwind, for 2.3 or 2.7, they gained a little bit of altitude, but then they began to lose altitude and airspeed, and the crew swung the wings full forward <clears throat> and lowered the flaps in an effort to buy them some more time. So at about the time of this ejection, they were down to about 300 feet above the ground and about 170 knots, and the aircraft is beginning to stall and has set up a substantial sink rate. So there goes the front canopy followed by the rear canopy. There goes the rear seat ejection. That seat ejects first so he didn't get blasted by the rocket blast from the front seat. Note the sink rate of the aircraft. And what seems like an eternity later at quarter speed, there goes the front seater. As the aircraft continues to sink and then eventually the left wing it rolls off on the left wing towards the apartment buildings which fortunately there were no injuries on the ground now we've already got the rear seat pilot already has his chute considerably higher altitude than the front seater boom he gets his chute right there the front seater barely gets a couple of swings in the chute before he is in the lake and note also how the high sink rate tends to cancel out the pop that you're going to get from the ejection seats. They pop out of the plane and they don't gain much altitude. They're, they're pretty much stuck at the altitude that they eject at. The absolute minimum altitude you would ever want to try to eject if everything works perfectly in the automatic ejection sequence of the KM-1 seat for the MiG-23. A little bit more about the MiG-23 and these ejection seats. Dan was able to acquire these MiG-23s through, I believe, a um, failed DOD contract deal. A lot of times uh, there are DOD contractors that will acquire these obscure old 
fighter aircraft and press him into DOD, Department of Defense contracts, to be aggressor aircraft for uh, military pilot training, active duty military pilot training. So they'll get contract pilots to fly these old airplanes and allow the... Um, the active duty Air Force folks to do BFM or basic fighter maneuvers or try and dogfight these these older aircraft. Give them some experience fighting some other aircraft other than 1v1 versus themselves all the time. Apparently this MiG-23 contract thing failed um, and so Dan was able to pick up I think three of these MiG-23s and got one of them at least one of them going with the plans of getting all three of them going show them to the world on the air show circuit and eventually sell them regarding the ejection seats yeah oftentimes the FAA doesn't like civilian aircraft to have active ejection seats however in the MiG-23 since it's only got one engine the ejection seat is considered essential equipment as we saw in this case here and so the FAA uh, they had no problem with the FAA in as regarding the operation and maintenance of these ejection seats the best source of technical material that I found on the MiG-23 comes from this video right here from the Western Museum of Flight where JB Brown explains his time flying both the MiG-21 and MiG-23 so JB had flown this exact aircraft, the MiG-23, and had a similar engine problem with this exact airplane some months or before this accident. JB Brown is the president and COO of the National Test Pilot School. So they use these aircraft in the test pilot school to train students of how to learn about these obscure aircraft and what some of their different flying characteristics are like. JB gives a great systems review of the MiG-23 and what the flight characteristics are like on this aircraft from a test pilot's perspective. Now JB is going to go through the explanation of a engine failure that he had in this very same aircraft, a failure of the fuel control unit. He was on a SFO or simulated flame out approach and landing where he had plenty of altitude and airspeed to work with to get the airplane back down. Let's check it out. Jim also explains the stall characteristics of the MiG-23 here. Um, as far as high angle of attack, the flight manual is very clear. I told you earlier that the stall occurs without warning, uh, followed by unexpected and spontaneous spin. Uh, so we've got to be very, very careful if we're going to go out there and do, uh, do stall work. It's got a stall warning system that uh, gives you clear indications that you're getting the angle of attack to places you don't want to be. And it also has a stall prevention st system. It's a uh, stick pusher. I'll show you a vi video of that working. Uh, you've got red lights to tell you that uh, you're, you're, uh, you're getting close to the stall and the angle of attack indicator uh, up there with uh, showing you where the angle of attack is. Okay. Now, JB's going to describe this simulated flame out landing. It takes him 14,000 feet from high key to landing if you're going to dead stick this this MiG-23, their first attempt, they found they were 3,000 feet too low, so they cranked it up to 14,000 feet. During the process of practicing the second flameout landing, the engine fuel control, it, control unit got stuck at idle. They were able to relight the engine successfully while they were completing this flameout, simulated flameout landing, which turned into basically a real flameout landing. Here's the description. Um, so we did some follow-on testing after the, uh, the cr after the cross country. Uh, we had a leak in the fuel control, so it took him like two years to get that fixed. 2018, we're out there. We're going to start this campaign. We had like four or five flights planned to get finish up his uh, type rating uh, training and get the airplane tested a little bit. So we're sorting out how to do a flame out approach. Is uh, you know it's a basic emergency procedure in a single engine airplane. I believe that's Dan Filer's type rating he's talking about. Uh, we had done one and we found that we were 3,000 feet too low as we came around on the, uh, on the final approach. So we aborted that, climbed back up. We added 3,000 feet to the whole problem, tried again. And as we're about 90 degrees into the turn, he tells me, hey, the engine's not responding to the throttle. So, okay, my airplane, I got it. You know, move the throttle. 
RPM just stays there. It's decayed down to about uh, 80 percent on the uh, on the core RPM. EGT is like 300 degrees. That's not a running thrust producing engine. And this is probably investigators will need to determine this if this is not exactly the same thing that happened at the during the air show. That's something that you know it's flamed out or whatever. Uh, so we ended up doing a engine shutdown and relight as we're turning base to final uh, on the thing. Uh, Remember, he started at 14,000 feet. Uh, not the most comfortable of uh, situations, um, but I was kind of happy to, uh, to see this. They got it to relight. Luckily, the engine started okay, and it responded to the throttle uh, after we went. They don't always use the drag chute because if they got a long enough runway, they can save the repacking of the drag chute. Here's a couple of checklist excerpts for the MiG-23. Failure of automatic fuel control system. This is probably the checklist the front seater was troubleshooting on the downwind there. As you can see, there's a lot of steps to it and you're gonna to have to have this checklist memorized because with 90 seconds to spare, you do not have time to reference the checklist, at least in this low altitude environment. Here's the in-flight engine start checklist. Note the airspeed envelope, 215 to 325 knots. These guys were very quickly outside of the envelope for the in-flight engine restart. And here's the ejection checklist where they're recommending an altitude between 6,500 feet minimum to 13,000 feet. Airspeed between 215 and 325 knots. So with the Willow Run Airport located right here, runway 23 being this runway, and the crew turning left downwind here and ejecting, and the aircraft crashing just up to the edge of these apartments at Waverly on the lake, at pattern altitude and at that speed, based on the testimony or based on the experience of J.B. Brown there, I would agree with the backseater that they were in no condition to be able to make it to either runway 27 or runway 23 for a forced landing at the Willow Run Airport at that altitude and that airspeed at that location and their only choice was to eject. Now, the front seater is gonna be busy troubleshooting the problem. It's the job of the back seater to working together as a crew to keep the crew notified as to their energy state, altitude and airspeed, and where they are in the ejection envelope. If the front seater gets too carried away with his work, or is trying too hard to save the airplane, it is incumbent on the backseater crew member to initiate the ejection sequence. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.